Okay. Great. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation to speak today. And so I'm going to speak about some work that we've been doing uh, for the, the last few years within our teaching in the School of Pharmacy and Medical Sciences. And so I'll particularly focus on the work in the first year chemistry courses that I teach into. Um, but I'd like to acknowledge my, um, my uh, co-workers here. So Associate Professor Jenny Wilson, Dr. Barbara Hadley, and Dr. Abdullah Karaksha. So we're all in the School of Pharmacy and Medical Sciences, which is in the health group of Griffith University. And uh, our school is primarily located on the Gold Coast campus. Okay, so within our first year um, programs within the health group, we run what's called Foundation Year Health. And so within Foundation Year Health, we have many different programs that will do a collection of the same courses together. So rather than running, for example, anatomy and physiology courses for all of these different programs, then they'll all do the same anatomy and physiology, same chemistry course in their first year. Um, so there's a lot of advantages to that. So by doing it at that larger scale, um, so we're able to you know, um, have some consistency there with the teaching and, and what gets taught to each of these students. But it also has some advantages in that students can swap between these programs after their first year and not have to repeat a whole year. So we do get, for example, students coming into the Bachelor of Health Science, and then their goal is to get into pharmacy or nutrition and dietetics or you know, some other program. So they can get in um, to a program with a lower entry score, do well in their first year, and then transfer into the second year of these other programs. So you can see there, there's the three schools. We did some um, bit of a, a merger of some schools a few years ago. And so this is what we have now. Um, there's five health group schools. And of those, three of them have programs in this foundation year health. So the School of Health Sciences and Social Works, so I think that's one of the more diverse schools that we have there. You can see exercise science, nutrition and dietetics, occupational therapy, physiotherapy and sport development. The school that I'm in there, pharmacy and medical sciences. So it has that suite of programs there. And then in the School of Medicine and Dentistry. So there's the, the two oral health programs as well as paramedicine. So we do have medicine, but that's a postgraduate program. So they're not involved in the foundation year courses. So a typical um, first year um, set of courses for these programs would be eight courses. And I've shown you that the program structure here for biomedical science and health science. So they have the identical first year courses there. So we can see there there's chemistry of biological systems one, and they would generally do this in their first trimester of study. And then that will lead into chemistry of biological systems two. So those are the two courses that I teach. And so that's what we'll be presenting today. So the other courses that students in these programs would also do. So in their first trimester, they've got this um, biomedical data analysis course. So it's a statistics course, cells, tissues, and regulation, which is a biology course, and then anatomy and physiology systems one. Um, and then in their second trimester, the other courses there, health challenges for the 21st century. So that's the only course out of these eight here which is not taught by the School of Pharmacy and Medical Sciences. So that one there is taught by the School of Medicine and Dentistry, but all the other seven there are taught from Pharmacy and Medical Sciences. Genes and Disease, which is another biology course and Anatomy and Physiology Systems too. For students in other programs, then they would do maybe not all eight, but maybe probably seven of eight or six out of eight there. So I've got some examples here. So in Nutrition and Dietetics, so they don't do the biomedical data analysis, but they do have a specific nutrition and dietetics course in their first year. But you can see again, if, like I said, if students did their first year in health science and then transferred into this course, then they would only have to pick up one first year course, not to complete the whole of first year again. Okay. And within pharmacy, no, another example here. So they've got six out of eight. So they don't do the, the biomedical data analysis or health challenges, but they've got their pharmacy specific courses there. And so different combinations, just depending on the programs. A few years ago, uh, Griffith went to a trimester model. I think it was 2017. 
And so we run three trimesters a year. Um, so we actually teach each of these courses twice a year, or they run twice a year. And so our largest intake is in trimester one. And so those four courses I showed just a second ago there, and then the, the courses in trimester two. Uh, but these courses here are repeated. So either in trimester two or in trimester three, and then the trimester two courses are then repeated in trimester three. And so there's some real advantages for students in that. So it allows us to have a T2 intake. So some of those programs there, students are able to start in trimester two, which is in July. Um, so that's also good for the international students who um, might finish their studies mid-year, able to come here in time for that. It allows students to spread their load a bit. So rather than doing four courses, four courses, and then having a trimester off, they could actually do three, three, and two. And so that way reduces their study load a little bit. Um, or if they fail a course, then they're able to repeat it and not fall a year behind. Okay. So I teach in the T1 and T2 offerings of these courses. So, all right, sorry. Uh, T1 for Chemistry of Biological Systems 1, and then Trimester 2, Chemistry of Biological Systems 2. So uh, my colleague, Dr. Abdullah Karaksha, teaches the repeat offerings of these courses. So Chemistry of Biological Systems 1 in T2, and then in um, Chem 2 in, in T3. So these two chemistry courses uh, in total, um, we've had up to 900 students in Chemistry of Biological Systems 1. So the numbers aren't quite as large these days. We're probably back a bit more manageable around the six to 700. That's because of offering these courses twice a year. And so um, we do get students spreading that load and moving into the, the repeat offering of that course. Uh, but we also had some program changes. And so we used to have exercise science students in these chemistry courses, but but they no longer have to do a chemistry course. So our numbers have dropped a little bit. So yeah, generally 500 to 900 in that first course. Um, this course that I'm running it currently, so I've got about 370, which is I think the smallest cohort that I've ever had in that, but has been up over the 600 mark in some years. So those are the two chemistry courses that these students would do in their first year. And then depending upon their program, they would do some combination of these biochemistry or organic chemistry courses in their second year. So I'm going to um, take you through these modules that we've created. I'm happy for you to click on those. I'm sharing the links for those. I'll also put them in the chat. So if you want to, you're welcome to follow along. Let me just find the chat window. Put there somewhere. Uh, yeah, chat. I'll put those links in the chat. Um, so if you've got another device or you want to follow along, then you're welcome to do that. But I'll be showing screenshots of these. Um, okay. So we started using um, these modules in second year biochemistry courses, and then we've adopted a lot of what we've learned from those into the first year courses there. And so what this looked like in a second year course would be for students before they come to the lab. So we know that labs are a really high value um, learning environment, but we need students to prepare before they come to the lab. So they've only got a limited amount of time in the lab and we don't want them spending the first 20 minutes reading their lab manual, then that's something that they should have done beforehand. And so this was an example here from a second year biochemistry lab where it was designed with these three doors. And so behind door one was the theory. So students would enter that one. They'd learn about the theory on what that lab is going to be about. Once they'd completed that, then door two would be open and that would take them through the experiment that they're going to be doing in that lab. Once they'd finished that one, then they'd be able to access door three and that would check that they understand what's going on. And once they've done all that, um, they've completed the module. And so what they, the lecturers would do would not let students into the lab and, until they had completed those modules there. And they could really see the difference. So if students had rushed through that and not paid any attention, they'd get to the lab and they wouldn't know what's going on. But where students have actually worked through that module, understood it, then they know what they're doing when they go into the lab. They're asking much more um, high 
knowledge questions. So uh, you know, they're troubleshooting and going, right, I was expecting to get these results, um, but this didn't work. So maybe could I try to do this and see if that would work? So asking those sorts of questions then rather like, how do I use the balance? Okay. So we did design this with some gamification elements. So probably depending on your definition of gamification, like it, it can be a bit of a choose your own journey with this. And I'll, I'll show this as we go through. Um, so there are, you know, um, aspects of this where you can either, like I said, you could go through it quite quickly. You could um, spend a lot of time working through these modules and, and getting a better understanding of it. So it really does put the onus back on the students a bit in terms of it's up to them to decide how much they, they want to learn out of this. Um, um, but we, yeah, we think that there's a lot of benefits to this. So I'll show you some examples here. Well, I'm not sure how to hide that top bit. Uh, let me just I'll click on that. Maybe it'll go away. There we go. All right. So as I said to you, chemistry lab is really valuable learning opportunities, but we do want students to come prepared to the lab. So um, lots of theory to back that up as well. Is that working? Okay. Yeah, so labs, you know, conceptually, procedurally demanding. Um, and as I said, yeah, prior to this in, in, intervention, students would often turn up to the labs, they wouldn't be prepared, they'd be spending time reading their lab manual, or the lab tutors would have to spend 20 minutes explaining um, what is going on in the lab and what the students need to do. So by getting students to complete these lab manuals, uh, modules before they come to the lab, then the instructors are able to spend less time giving the instructions. So the, the onus is a lot more on the students to come to the lab prepared, okay? In terms of engagement, so literature is showing us here that students decide when they'll pay attention. Um, the pre-lab videos do increase engagement if they are used. And so you'll see in these modules, we do have these pre-lab videos. So students can see the experiments before they do them. And that does help them to understand. Um, they do have some a little anxiety about how to carry out these experiments. And so seeing it done beforehand is really beneficial at reducing that. Those gamification design principles used to increase the engagement. So um, I'll show you some aspects of that. Okay, but I don't think that's the most important aspect of these modules. Um, we know that yeah, teaching competes with other attractions for time. So students are spending a lot of time online uh, and they also have you know, many other aspects of their lives. Um, so whether that's work, family, sport, other commitments as well. And so university is not the main thing they do. It's, it's one of many things that they do. It's not the only thing that they do. And our teaching methodology also needs to evolve and keep pace. Okay, so what may have worked well, you know, pre-COVID times is no longer um, going to continue to work. So we have been developing these modules for a few years now. We did start off designing them with Smart Sparrow. Um, however, Smart Sparrow got decommissioned or bought out, and um, so we had to look for an alternative. Um, platform in which to develop these modules. And the one that we've decided on is Articulate. So with Smart Sparrow, there were a lot of advantages of that. It gave us some really great analytics. So you could see what students clicked on, what they got right and wrong, where like the pathway that they followed. Um, but it was a little bit challenging to create all the resources, a bit more time consuming. I found with Articulate, it's a lot more user friendly. So you don't need any programming skills to do the vast majority of um, the content that I'm going to show you here. Um, but the analytics that you get out of it aren't as anywhere near as good as what we got from Smart Sparrow. So as I said, we did design these, we started working on these a few years ago, and then COVID hit and everything shifted to being online. I think we were well placed because we had already started creating a lot of online resources. And so where we had that sudden shift to online learning, um, we were, yeah, as I said, pretty well placed there. So um, we had recordings of lab videos. And so we were able to use those as a virtual lab for the students. So 
they were able to watch those videos, you know, record the results out of those. And that was the, you know, the alternative that we had um, during COVID. And now that we're coming back onto campus and students are able to do the labs again. Um, so we're treating these modules as a pre-lab. So they, they watch them or complete these modules before they come on campus and do the labs and they have a lot more confidence when they're doing the labs. And so we're trying to um, take a lot of the learnings that we had out of those that COVID period and still um, you know, incorporate the best aspects of that into our, our teaching now. Um, with some of the activities like this one here, I'm gonna show you on the right with the calculator. So we can um, change the feedback depending upon what the students input. Okay, so this one um, was developed by my colleague, Dr. Barb Hadley. So this is one of the few here where you, you're not able to do the most basic um, design. It took a, a fair bit more work to create this calculator with the, um, the preferential feedback there. Um, but you'll, you'll see as we click through these slides here, depending upon what the students answer, you can tailor the feedback there. Okay, so we designed these pre-lab modules, yeah, help students understand the concepts and procedures they would encounter in each lab. Within each module, we made sure that they were multimodal. So you'll see that there's a mix of videos, images, texts, or activities, quizzes, and GIFs. So we wanted to break it up. We just didn't want large blocks of text or you know, hour long videos. They just, students switch off really quickly if you, present them with that. So by mixing it up, keeps it a lot more interesting, keeps the students engaged, okay? Uh, we can label these activities as being optional. So if it's something that, you know, it's not mandatory that students do, but you know, this might be, if you're interested in this and you wanna learn more, you can click on this video or read this article. Um, so you can label these aspects as optional. Um, and I think that's been really helpful too. So if we made students do everything, watch every video, um, read every link that we put on there, then it would take students, you know, probably more than their allotted 12 hours a week um, to do all of this. So I think that labeling um, these activities as being either, you know, mandatory or highly recommended or, or optional is really beneficial for the students. So you can see here on the, the activity on the right. So uh, how many significant figures in this number here? So 35. 0.0445, so students trying to work this out. If they're answering the wrong number here, then they're getting the feedback on that. They've entered another wrong number here. So again, different feedback depending on their answer there. I'll get it right soon, I'm sure. Um, so progress for, through these modules can be restricted. Um, so what we've done for the lecture modules is um, to not restrict that so students can move up and down through that lecture content. But with the lab um, modules, we want to make sure that they cover everything in that. And so they are restricted to, you know, from skipping, you know, just scrolling all the way through. So they've either got to mark something as complete or get a, a certain score on a quiz before it allow them to progress to the next section on that. Okay, so that way, we can be more confident that when they come into the lab, that they've answered the questions, you know, at an 80% level in order to have completed the module, okay? We've designed these modules for different learning styles. So having that multimodal, um, you know, form there, you'll also see that there are, um, yeah, videos, oh, sorry, there's, there's audio narration that we've got on large blocks of text. And so I think that would be really beneficial for visibly impaired students. Uh, would also be really good for where there's terms that you might not know how to pronounce. I know I've certainly, I'm probably guilty of myself talking um, with terms that I've only ever read in a book and not heard out loud. And so my pronunciation might not be correct on that, but um, we should be you know, able to add that narration there. And so then students are actually hearing the correct pronunciation of these terms. I also think it's good too if um, for a large block of text where students might be reading that, but they can hear the audio along with it at the same time, that might just help them to, to stay focused on it as well. So after completing these modules, so students have reported confidence, independence, yeah, discipline, knowledge, and lab ownership. So they're really turning up to the lab 
feeling like they're knowing what it is they're going to be doing in the lab. And okay, so finally our med student here, whatever he is, has got the number of significant figures correct. And so we can see, yeah, different feedback um, now that they've got that one correct. Okay, so for these two chemistry courses that I teach, so the first one is a general chemistry course. And so in that, we have lots of calculations. So it's very mathematical based. So they'll learn things like um, moles and gases and concentrations of solutions. Um, and then for the second chemistry course, it's organic and biological. So they'll learn more about different functional groups and then how those functional groups are relevant to carbohydrates and proteins and lipids and our metabolism. So I'll show you some examples here. I've got one slide on each of these. So the first one that we're going to go through is the first lab in the first chemistry course. And so this is on where students are learning about measurements. So you can see here, I've just these are just you know, screenshots from various components of the modules here. So we can put in images. I'm not, can you see the, the pointer that I've got there or do I need to change to? Uh, we can see it. You can see it? Okay. Yeah, yes, we can. Okay. Let me go back. So you can see here, we've got the image, um, you know, text with that. You can you know, obviously format that with bold and colors and whatever you want to do. That activity I just showed you there, we've got other knowledge checks. So this is one example of that. So a drag and drop here where students are you know, reinforcing what they've just covered there with the different system of units there. So milligram, what are the, the abbreviation for that one? So that's a drag and drop activity. And then we've got the video there on the activity that students are doing in the lab. So they're measuring temperature. So they would have seen, you know, ice and water and it was stirred with the glass rod and then they're putting the thermometer in there. And if they aren't able to go in the lab and do that themselves and they can pause on the video and zoom in and record the temperature, for example, you know, from that activity. Okay, next one then would be the lecture modules that um, yeah, on measurement. So we took a lot of what we learned from doing those pre-lab modules and changed all of our lectures across to this way as well. So again, we've got that multimodal delivery so we've got videos that we created. And so this one here was, you know, from our PowerPoint slides, we had recorded videos. And so we actually did this, I think back in 2015 was the first time that we started pre-recording these videos and making these available online. So this was, um, I think, sort of you know, quite advanced for its time. Um, those videos now probably a little bit data. I think one of our next activities might be to re-record those and, and update those a little bit, but they served us really well um, throughout that COVID period there, having all of these pre-recorded videos. So that was not someone standing in a lecture theater and just the audio recording of that. These were specifically designed as the online delivery of the course. So where that repeat offering of these, these courses uh, in T2 and T3. So we have our own videos there, but we can also put in links to other videos, whether that's from Khan Academy or Crash Course or, or whatever it might be as well. Uh, so we've got text. And again, as I said, you can format that however you like. And then knowledge checks. So another example of a knowledge check here being a flip card. So um, what I've done with a lot of the, the weekly exercises that we would assign students would be um, to have them in these flip cards. And so students are able to look at that and, oh, sorry, and then try and work out what the answer would be, flip the card over and it gives them the answer. So I think that's a really effective strategy. And we had a lot of feedback from students. They want more of these. So they really like being able to test their knowledge um, just after they've learned a subject. Okay, so the next one here would be the lab from uh, the chemistry two course. So this is on aldehydes and ketones. So this lab is in week two of the course and it's on content that students actually haven't covered in lectures yet. So it is really important that students uh, understand this before they go into the lab. So aldehydes and ketones are two functional groups. They've got some similarities and some differences and the students do these tests to see the similarities and differences between these functional groups. So they've got these four compounds here. So 
formaldehyde, benzaldehyde, three pentanone and acetone. And these are either you know, aldehydes or ketones. And then we have these four functional group tests. And what should happen is that for each test, so in that first test, the 2,4-DNP test, that should give a positive result for each of these compounds. Whereas in other tests like the iota form test, that will only work for methyl ketones. And so you can see there, we've got the theory behind it and explaining that reaction. Um, but I like this table here because what we're getting students to do with this is to predict the outcome for these functional group tests. So beforehand, what I'd let's see would students would turn up to the lab, they'd have their test tube rack like this, and there'd be, you know, some of these would be, you know, silver and some of them would be clear. And they'd say, oh, it worked in some and it didn't work in the others. And they wouldn't have any understanding on what's actually happening in this reaction. So what we make them do is to make their predictions here. And if they get it wrong, they can't progress. So they've actually got to think about what this test is, you know, what's, what should be a positive result in this test. So if it's the iota form test, it's going to be methyl ketones. The only methyl ketone is acetone. So that's the only positive result that you would expect for this. And all of the other ones there would be a negative result. And so that way they should then have a much better understanding of what to expect when they get in the lab, but why they're getting positive or, or negative results for you know, those tests. Um, they also have an unknown, which is going to be one of these. And so they, they're then using their results to work out what their unknown compound is. And again, we've got the video of that test being conducted in the lab there. So if they are unable to get to the lab, they can watch the video uh, and use that for their results that they need to report on. The last one here is um, some content from the chemistry two um, first module of the lectures. So this is on hydrocarbons, so the alkanes. And so you can see yeah, some of our videos there, links to videos from other sources. Where we do have large blocks of text, then we're able to put them in these accordion style um, blocks here. So you can see that these are able to be expanded or minimized. And so rather than having a, a large block of text appear all at once, then what we're able to do is, you know, only have one paragraph appear at a time. And then once students have read that, they're able to open the next one. So it's a bit less daunting for them than having large blocks of text. What we do at the end of each module is to get feedback from the students. And so they're rating, you know, how how good the um, module was itself, how prepared they feel, uh, what worked, what didn't work. And then we're constantly updating these modules to improve them. Like I said, they want more of those flip cards to test their, um, their knowledge on that subject um, or including the audio narrations here. So here's an example. I won't play it now, but the audio narration. So there's a little, um, you, you put in an audio file and it'll play uh, the either myself or Bob or whoever had recorded um, the speaking of that block of text there. Okay, so like I said, uh, really would be helpful if they were visually impaired students, but I think other students are, are taking advantage of that as well. Some other feedback that we got from students, so where we had this large block of text here next to this GIF. So students were saying it was actually quite distracting having that GIF, the moving image there on the left, when they're trying to concentrate on this block of text on the right. So that was really useful feedback for us. So then what we did was to change it either to a static image or to remove it completely. So um, some really useful feedback. So I think the benefits of these modules, so certainly for the labs, um, a lot less time taken for instruction. So the, the instructors should really be able to keep that quite short and we expect students to have done the modules and so they, they shouldn't need um, another you know long explanation of what to do during the lab. So that gives them more time for the experiment. So rather than running out and not being able to complete everything, we now have enough time for the students to, to get through everything they're asked to do in the labs. I still run online lectures. And so what I expect is that students have worked through that module first, and then I run three hours of lectures a week. And so um, what that means though, is I don't have to cover everything in those online lectures. So 
I teach as if students have completed those modules. And then what I try and do is to pick out the, the challenging topics, I think, and I'm able to spend a bit more time going through those than I would have if it was, um, you know, back when we're in you know, classrooms and trying to deliver everything. So I, I do try and, I think I've seen a, a spectrum here. So I've seen some lecturers teach as if the mod modules don't exist and they just try and cover everything. I've tried to run it myself where it's more like a tutorial and I've asked students which aspects they don't understand. And um, I might not get through as much material, but I can get through some smaller amounts. And I think they're, some students might find that a little bit frustrating if they understood that content. Um, they probably want a bit of a balance out of that. So some a bit more structure to it, but still able to respond to student queries as we go through. So um, I, I'm still getting the right balance there, but I, I do think there's a lot of advantages out of that. Another advantage I think too, is that because we repeat these courses, so we were able to get that consistency in the delivery there. So the, the content that gets caught, get taught in T1, T2, we're using those same modules again in T2, T3. So even if we've got different staff delivering it, then it's going to have that consistency of delivery. In terms of getting students to complete these modules, so for the lab modules, then we have assigned a small weighting to their completion. So 0.5% for each lab. So if they complete the lab module before the deadline, then they get that 0.5%. Um, so that seems to be enough of a, a carrot there in order to get most students to completing that. I do um, a little bit lenient when they first start out, give them a few reminders, maybe extend the deadline by a day or two. Um, but you know, as we get further into the course, I think they should be responsible enough and know the drill to know that they have to have it done um, before the first lab of the week. In second year, um, they've got smaller number of students and the students are a bit more, you know, progressed through their, their journey. So the expectation there is that they have completed before the lab, they're not able to enter the lab um, until they've actually completed those modules. So I just don't think I'd be able to, to monitor that with 700 students in first year. Uh, in terms of the number of students completing the module. So this is on the left here, we've got data from that first chemistry course. So this is where we had 530 students. So the five labs there, you can see the completion of the labs up around the 500 there throughout the course. So really happy with that. In terms of each of the lecture modules, so there are 14 modules there. You can see, um, you know, really, you know, certainly above 400 for the vast majority of these. Um, but this is the, the main delivery of the content for the students. So we didn't provide them with lecture notes. So this is the, the, the main way that they're at, able to access the content. Um, I would say too that the content, it, you know, does very closely um, follow what they're getting from the textbook. But I think this is just a much more engaging way of delivering that content. Uh, for the Chem 2 course, so this is data from last year. So, because I'm still currently running that for this year. So we had the five labs there. So lab three, students actually had a choice of doing either lab 3A or 3B. So if you add those numbers together, it gets it over the 400 mark here. And interesting to see with lab five. So this is the one where they had to write a lab report. So interesting that a um, little bit of an uptick in that one there. So that was the assessment for that was worth um, about the same as the first four put together. So yeah, a few more students doing that one. Uh, the lecture modules, there was one there on revision. So what I did was to take the important concept, concepts out of this CHEM 1 course, package them together into a revision, but that wasn't new content for students there. You can see quite a few chose to do that, but some chose not to. Um, and then content here. So up till module seven here on lipids. So that was the content on the mid trimester exam. And then content there on the final exam. In terms of student marks, so we can see on the x-axis here, so number of modules completed. This is from Chem 1 this year and the overall mark. So I think it was 19 would have been considered a, a full 
number of modules. So those five labs and the 14 lecture modules. Um, what does happen with Articulate is it's a, it's exported from Articulate as a SCORM file and then uploaded to our learning management system. So if you make any changes, you actually have to upload a new SCORM file. And so um, this, if there's more than 19, that would just be from students who have done both versions of the module. So it got counted twice there, but 19 would be considered a full load. Um, I don't try and read too much into this um, because yeah, correlation and causation. So students that are doing the work are going to get better marks. It doesn't mean that the modules themselves are solely responsible for them getting higher marks. And in terms of student feedback, then we can see here um, evaluation of the lab modules. So they felt prepared for the lab, generally around four out of five there. So students agreeing on that. The last lab there on gases was a little bit lower. And then uh, for the second question here, so I learned more from the modules than from reading the lab manual. So again, generally agreeing with that, a little bit lower for experiment five. To me, that is just telling me that stu students are still unclear about gases and, and what to do in that last experiment. So um, that would probably be a good prompt for us to go back and look at that, see if there's any way that we can improve that. So students feel a bit more confident about the gases and equations and what they need to do in that experiment there. Student feedback on our um, course evaluation. So you can see there uh, lots of opportunities for practice. It was really easy to understand. Um, they really liked that they could go through it in their own time. So this was great for people that are, you know, they might be working, they've got families, and so they're able to um, complete these when they have an actual window of time to do it. They can take as long as they need for the challenging concepts. They can skip through stuff that they find really easy. Um, yeah, a lot of flexibility. They liked it was a variety of formats and they were really engaging. Okay, so I provided you with those links there. I think that that would be the best way for you to experience those is to actually work through it yourself and you'll see, you know, um, just what goes into each of these modules. Uh, so I'd like to yeah, acknowledge my colleagues there. So Jenny, Abdullah and Barb. Got our references and happy to, to take any questions. Thanks, Henry, for this very interesting presentation, and uh, it's very informative. Uh, uh, I like it how you just uh, uh, look at uh, student, student feedback, then you reflect, and then you try to change it and improve it. This is really great. Um, do you have any questions in the chat? Um, I have a few questions. You kind of, ah, Simon, you. <laughs> no, I was going to say, thanks, Andrew, for the presentation. Um, I was just curious about Articulate. You, you mentioned that um, it doesn't give you much in the way of uh, analytics. So what, what kind of data can you get out of it? Like just what, what they've clicked on or what they've done or anything like that? So what we, what, all I've been really using it for is whether they've completed the module or not. So at the moment with Blackboard, I can either see it as being in progress or complete yep. or, or not accessed at all. Um, so I think you could set it up that you could get scores. Uh, you know, so you can definitely do that. Um, but I don't think you could get, you know, how many clicks or how yeah, long they yeah, spend yeah. on it. it. It's sort of, and then as we go from Blackboard, into Canvas, um, yep. I might change again on on. <laughs> yes, <Canvas. laughs> that's that's something for us all to look forward to. I think. <laughs> yeah, so I'm sure that the SCORM file will still work going into Canvas. Um, it's just yeah, like I said, Smart Sparrow was really detailed analytics, and this is probably just a little bit light on that. There, there are different settings that you can have, and I am not the expert in that. So we have actually Barb is our the school expert on Articulate, so. She's been like the, the one who's responsible for managing all of the, the different modules for all the different courses. So it's, we've now, as we've got the first year chemistry pretty much you know, under control with those labs and lecture modules, working on second year biochemistry and chemistry and, and data analysis. And so she's the one that is our expert on that. So yeah, you know, I'm Cheers. sure specific questions like that, Barb's the one to do. No Go worries. To... Thanks, man. I enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Yeah. Um, Andrew, can I just ask you a few questions? Um, 
Yeah. Uh, well, I've, uh, uh, if anybody else would like to ask questions, can you please put them in the chat and they'll ask it. Um, I wanted to ask you, but then I think you kind of answered them during your presentation, but I'm still going to ask you. So because we have kind of same thing, we have laboratories and always kind of want like my students to prepare for the laboratory. So what if or like what happens if they actually like don't get prepared? Um, uh, do we have like such experience like because like uh, sometimes I ask my students, let's say, to like uh, watch a video or like read like instructions and then they just don't do anything. So how do you like deal with so this situation? Or like, do we have like uh, students like that? Yeah, absolutely. And so that can be really noticeable in the labs. And so where like you give minimal instruction at the lab because you've expected that they've you know done the work beforehand. And then you'll see some students, you know, straight into the activity. And, and then the other students are like standing around going, what are we meant to do? And oh, how do I, you know, and so, you know, I think other students are then are able to point to them like if you if you did the module first, then you would know what to do here. And so um it's it's you know, like I said, that trying to encourage that behavior to make sure that they do the work first. And so by awarding them that 0.5%, um, it, it should be enough that you know, but again, I'm still having to contact students and you know, every lab week i'm like downloading a list of who's completed it and then emailing all those that haven't and reminding them and then i'll still get you know people a few days later going oh why, don't, why can't i access the module now and it, it i think yeah it, it's still I, I don't have a, a perfect answer to that yet but I, it, it does require a bit of training in terms of the expectations and so trying to set them out clearly at the start of the course and say you know you will have labs in these weeks and you will need to complete the lab module before this date and you know if you don't do that then this is the ramifications of that thanks um another question i wanted to ask you which is related to the first question you said that um if they complete they're going to get 0 0.5 points what is the, the total percentage for each laboratory is it uh so generally five percent uh, five percent yeah and so 0.5 for the it's kind of 10 percent of module and then the other so it's a little bit different in the chem 2 course i think it's three percent per lab but then the lab report is worth um 12 maybe 13 percent so yeah anyway so i'll yeah i think 0.5 percent mm. to me is it's not massive, but it, it is yeah, it should be that's enough. Reasonable, yeah. if, they, if they don't do it for five labs, and that's two and a half percent, and that you know, could easily be the difference in a grade. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That, that's true. Um, and just uh, another question, because I have something similar in my laboratories. You know, uh, we run face-to-face -face laboratories, but sometimes students get sick, right? So they cannot attend face-to-face. -face, yeah. And then you already like finish like running that laboratory. So uh, what do you do in that situation when they say, well, I was sick and then they have a medical certificate? Yeah, so in that case, I'd say you'll get the, you know, get your results from the videos in the module. So um, yeah, like if they had COVID, there's all sorts of, yeah, and we used to have, um, before we had these modules, what we would do would be if students didn't turn up to the lab, they wouldn't get the, the quiz mark from the lab that they missed. Whereas now going through COVID and coming out the other side of that, it's, you know, it, of course is probably whether, you know, our chemistry courses do it different to the anatomy and we, we probably got to come up with a consistent model, but I'm, giving them marks for doing the pre-lab modules. I tell them the labs are compulsory, but I'm not actually penalizing them for not turning up to the labs, but they need to answer questions based on the lab. And so if they um, have done the module, then they will still have access to those videos afterwards. But if they don't complete the module by the deadline, then I cut off access. And so that's gonna make it really challenging for them to correctly answer the questions in their, their lab workbook or on their, their lab report. Okay, thanks. I think we have a question from Diana, right? Diana, raise your hand. Ah, oh, yes, thank you very much. Um, I was wondering, I just had a little jump in and had a look at a couple of the modules and I can see that 
there were different instructional design um, choices made for various things. Um, we're in the similar situation where we have uh, developed online modules um, within the Faculty of Science and Engineering, but we chose to take do different things for different reasons. But I was wondering if you actually looked deeper um, into the user experience based on those instructional design choices? So I guess, you know, the analytics we get from Articulate hasn't been able to shed any light on that, but what I could probably do, and I haven't done yet, is to look for that sort of feedback from all the student evaluations that we get at the end of each module. So um, that would be really interesting to look at, I think. Okay, yeah, all right, thank you. Thanks for the suggestion. Yeah, thanks, man. Uh, more questions? Um, I don't see question. Um, Andrew, like you said that you have this like blocks and then like when you show some uh, examples, uh, I, I noticed that says like this one will take seven minutes. The other one will take probably three minutes. So for each kind of like blocks, like for like laboratory and like lectures, uh, like how long on average, like each block will take and like for, like for students like to complete and stuff. Like yeah. That. Um, so uh, look, I guess the best answer to that would be for you to actually work through those modules yourself. And you can see that if you were to watch every video and try you know, and follow every link, it would take several hours. Several hours. You, well, so I guess my ideally, that wouldn't be the case for the lab. Maybe the lab might be 20 minutes. Um, but I, look, I try and design these so that if students they should be able to learn enough from these modules that they don't have to turn up to lectures. I still run the lectures, but mm -hmm. ideally everything that I want to get across should be in these modules. And so where we had three hours of lectures before, then there would be, you know, and they might take them, you know, it might take two hours, but like I said, there are, there are optional videos. If they wanted to watch every video, mm -hmm. then it's going to take them significantly longer than that. But some of those videos are, are just for interest or we might only you know, want them to watch a short section of that. Yeah, I, see. I think Diana has another question, right? Yeah, it's about so impact in the laboratory. The lab, yeah, so certainly um, need for demonstrative training. So I, I do have um, some senior tutors who have you know been teaching for a few years for me and they certainly try and um, adapt their teaching so with the expectation there that that the students have done the work first okay so um, and we'll probably see that in both first and second year so if yeah if, if students haven't done the modules they'll be confused in the labs but if they have done the modules then they're asking much better questions okay so um, yeah it, it, it's been noticeable but you know still got to work out how to get all the students to complete these modules before they come to the lab. Yeah, thanks. I think Simon wants to ask a question. All right, Simon, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, I can imagine it's often a struggle to figure out a way to get them all, well, all of them to do the modules. Um, you mentioned about lectures. Do you think those uh, resources would um, replace lectures or could be used instead of lectures? Because you, you mentioned that um, while you've still got lectures, a lot of the content probably is in those modules. So is, is that something you're going to move towards? Well, so in the repeat offerings of these courses, so Abdullah doesn't have lectures. Um, he has compulsory tutorials. Yep. And so there's still that follow up and he might do a bit of revision in there to mm. make sure that students understand the core concepts out of those modules. I, um, look, I, I would have thought that I, wouldn't need to do the lectures but yeah, there's still yeah. many students there that find it confusing or you know it's they've still got questions and so that's why i'm still happy to run lectures yep. i don't get great attendance to those and they are recorded so it is like i said it's a little bit like a choose your own adventure so i'm not sure you know if the students aren't doing the modules mm -hmm. and they're not turning up to lectures you know where are they learning from <laughs> yes 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 that would be a bit of a challenge. Yeah, so 
um, like I understand students are busy, so I don't expect mm-hmm. full attendance at, at lectures. And like I said, if I've des- if they've done these modules and understood everything, they shouldn't have to turn up to lectures. And so, you know, I'm sort of, you know, designed it in a way that they're not going to be turning up. But if they're not doing the modules and they're still not turning up, then yeah when are they yeah going to do it? They'll, they'll reap their own rewards there i suspect <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i've got a, my attitude then is that i treat them as responsible adults and it's up mm-hmm. to them to decide how much effort they're going to put in and they'll then get the understanding and the grade as a you know will be a reflection on the effort that they put in yeah, it makes sense because uh, I, I know you mentioned the repeat offering. It's typically they'll have they'll go through the content and then someone will be there in a like a tutorial to discuss things further. So I was initially thinking, oh, maybe that they do those resources and then they can come and it's almost like having a lectorial slash tutorial slash call it what you like to discuss yeah. the the questions they may have. But if a lot of them are not looking at the resources, then yeah, that way they can choose. Well, are you more comfortable? doing the articulate or would you prefer to have a um, a more normal yeah. lecture and they can yeah, choose yeah. that way yeah that they can sense. decide to read the textbook if they want and yep. you know if that's how they learn best then mm. you know for the for the lecture content then you know certainly that's their choice mm-hmm. um i think with the labs you know we, we're trying to at least with that have everyone prepared and know that the balance that we're going to use in the lab or whatever it might be. So um, that's the the one there that we're really driving them and, and by having that assessment mark yep. you know, attached to it um, is you know, the other way of really trying to, you know, show its importance. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, thanks everybody. A really good discussion. I think we will should conclude our session soon. It's almost 3 p.m. I have a few more questions, but probably uh, I will ask uh, uh, Andrew next time uh, when I see you on campus. So I'm not going to uh, ask anymore. Yeah. Um, uh, again, thanks for your time. Uh, thanks for this uh, interesting presentation. Thanks for sharing your experience. Um, because I think what we're doing kind of similar to like what you have and we have kind of a similar issue. So I think that's like really great that you share this like with us and then maybe we can think maybe we can do a little bit better <laughs> next time when we teach our students and uh, try to prepare them for the lab. Yeah, thanks again. And uh, uh, thanks uh, everybody for joining the session and have a nice um, uh, afternoon and have a nice weekend. Yeah, thanks, thanks everyone. everybody. Bye. Bye, everybody.